Good evening, everyone. Um, could you please stand so that we could salute the flag? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. There stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for attending tonight's school committee meeting. Opening day, as they say. Um, the mayor will be attending. Um, she's a few minutes. A f oh, she is. Wow. There you go. Okay. The mayor is attending. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Well, just following orders, start the meeting on time. You did. You did very well. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Item. We did Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. All right. So first item on the agenda is the hearing of visitors. So at this time we will remind uh, individuals that um, in fact you have three minutes. There is no uh, dialogue give and take or give and take. And uh, I will say publicly that if there are any comments regarding certain individuals, I will take the liberty to. Um, allow that person to uh, respond, but I'm going to hold you to three minutes. So the first uh, item, uh, the first individual is Rasta Pina. How are you guys doing tonight? All right, I have another written prepared statement. <clears throat> so, so, uh, all right, good evening. Tonight, we as concerned citizens of Brockton would like to talk about the nationwide bipartisan neoliberal effort to deprofessionalize the teaching profession. By taking a look at the Walmart funded and created Teach for America organization, we can see how this deprofessionalization is unfolding. This organization's deep pocketed funders also funded and wrote the new state mandated partnership for assessment of readiness for college and careers. This is achieved by taking young recent college graduates through a five week training program. From here, these so-called teachers are then expected to teach an actual class of 30 students with no supervision from a real teacher. The teach for America Corps members are scabs that undermine the teaching profession by providing a cheap, low-skill, temporary, and obedient labor force. Young recruits are taught to believe that they are equally effective as veteran, traditionally trained teachers. In fact, recruits are taught to <clears throat> try to see traditionally trained teachers as part of the problem with our education system. Throughout our nation, Teach for America instills neoliberal ideas for solving problems in education. They ex in ex express an overemphasis on state-designed, standardized tests, extreme personal responsibility on teachers, and implementing market logic as the solution to problems in education. So, if students do poorly, then the remedy is to further shrink the scope of the curriculum and increase class time spent training uh, students to take tests. Locally, the Huntington Elementary School has a partnership with Bridgewater State University, uh, <clears throat> which future teachers working on Common Core lesson plans with current teachers uh, are working on Common Core lessons plans with current teachers. Effectively, this acclimates future educators to a shortened curriculum focus that contributes to an erosion of teacher skills. Huntington also increased the school day, presumably to have more time for taking tests uh, on a narrowed curriculum. Huntington School received $700,000 for embracing these neoliberal education policies from race to the top. This is further proof that Barkton's education leadership must wake up and acknowledge that these policies are part of a larger plan to, plan to break the teaching profession and their union. If they fail to do so, then we will see less skilled teachers teaching our children fewer topics to pass tests designed by big money organizations that are undermining the public education education system. That's okay. it. Thank you. Um, the other individual has signed in. It's Charleston, and I'm sorry, Charleston, Monfort? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
I'm also here to talk about um, the deprofessionalization of the teaching profession. Um, teachers provide multiple services. Um, Teachers provide multiple services um, to students in the community that can't be measured by standardized testing or common core state standards. Um, cognitive development and foundational knowledge are crucial skills that develop through the teacher-student relationship. Um, the new education reform offers a one-size-fits-all education. Students in different areas require education unique to their environment, especially those growing up in poverty, which in Brockton is approximately 72%. And studies have shown that poverty creates a gap in education. Um, Students also require daily human interaction and activities that enhance cognitive, physical, and social emotional development. Um, they also need to engage in meaningful conversations and language throughout the day. Active learning, of course, is a crucial, a crucial element to education as well. Um, Long-term committed teachers provide intangible components of education, and those are the ones that need to um, be compensated as well. Um, Teach for America is replacing teachers with Common Core State Standards and a five-week training program for their new teachers. This new generation of teachers has no long-term attention to education remaining in the program for only about two years. Um, this is designed to deprofessionalize the teacher. It also helps eliminate teachers' benefits and unions. Um, in certain school districts, Common Core State Standards are the main guide to instruction, and textbooks are used as backup, which we feel is not the right direction to go in. And um, teachers are also being required to spend hours developing skills with trade books and materials. Um, as my colleague stated, race to the top is moving to the charter, moving the charter tap, um, cap to the lowest 10 percent. This allows principals and superintendents in mainly urban areas turn over power to replace uh, poorly performing teachers and extend school days and amend union contracts. And that's the direction we feel like things are going. Um, uh, as an example, um, one school fought against that in 2009 is the Kent School District in Washington, and they staged a 17-day walkout over classroom size and excessive demands on um, actual class time and faculty meetings. Um, fortunately for them, the Seattle Education Association and Washington Education Association supported them, as well as the parents of that community, and they were given small concessions that um, gave teachers smaller class size and reduced it to 30, which is sh still shouldn't be at, but um, there was also pay adjustments made for teachers with longer classes and uh, larger classes. So we just want to make sure that things are going in the right direction and teachers and students are receiving everything that they should. Thank you. We now move on to the next item of business, which is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the manner in which uh, the, mem uh, the school committee deals with items of routine business. I will ask at this time if there are any items that uh, members of the school committee wish to have uh, removed to be dealt with individually. Mr. Minicello. Item F, um, enclosure number seven, page 29, Gelfand Family Charitable Trust. Okay. So the, uh, the remaining items under F are fine, but just that particular one? Okay. Motion to approve the remaining items. With the exception of the Gelfand? Correct. Is there a second? All in favor? Oh, on the motion, Mr. Carpenter? Mayor, uh, if we could, I would like to also uh, consider separately Title I and Title II uh, proposals. Okay. So um, the motion would be then to uh, move the consent, consent agenda, agenda forward with the, with the exception of the Title I, Title II, and Gelfand family enclosures. Uh, that would be my Thank you, Mr. Minichello. Is there a second? Second. Motion to remain seconded. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Mr. Minichello on the Gelfand Family Charitable Trust. Um, I was just wondering if we could have Ka uh, Karen Watts come down and just talk to us briefly about the Gelfand Family Charitable Trust. Good evening. Good evening. Um, nice to see you, Mrs. Watts. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on this charitable trust and also remind the committee and the community of the um, involvement that the school system has had with respect to um, prior involvement and, and um, u uh, utilization of the charitable trust in the district that has already taken place? Sure, sure. And then I'll also ask uh, Jonathan Shapiro to speak to the current grant. We've worked actually quite a lot, uh, quite a lot together on this. Um, the Gelfand Family Charitable Trust uh, first um, was introduced to the district, I'm going to say, in 2010. And they um, 
were able to um, work with us on a proposal to um, to their gyms, which is a uh, gyms program, which is Gelfand Endeavors in Massachusetts. That's the gyms program. Gym, I'm sorry, Gelfand Endeavor in Massachusetts Schools. That's the acronym of gyms. And they actually initially funded two science labs for the district, one at the South Middle School and one at Ashfield Middle School. Um, and that, and after that, uh, since then, we've um, last year, uh, they've uh, funded a $20,000 planning grant to um, implement um, a district-wide STEM initiative in the in the in the well, basically all the schools, K to 12. K to 12, and and, uh, and this grant is actually the launch of the implementation of that four-year plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jonathan Shapiro is our head of our department, uh, science department here at the high school, and he's led that initiative along with um, Joan Farrington, who's head of math and science for six to eight, and Heather Ronan, who's um, in charge of math and science K to five. So, so far, the, the middle schools have really benefited from those science labs. Obviously, they must be in, in much use, great use over there. Oh, it's um, been tremendous for those schools um, to have those state-of-the-art facilities for them. And if mm -hmm. the district is fortunate enough to obtain this grant, mm -hmm. how would uh, the resources be spent and utilized in the district? I'll let Jonathan speak to that. Um, the Gelfand grant is going to fund three main initiatives. One is professional development of science, technology, engineering, math teachers throughout the district. We're also going to be doing a lot of curriculum development, and we'll also be they will also be supporting the science fairs throughout the district and expanding the science fairs down into the elementary grades. In uh, in the past year, the Gelfand grant also funded the science fair at the high school. Great. So the. Um the lab at the high school, it's, does that have any involvement with the Gelfand family that was just util, uh, that was just built in the um, Fine Arts building, or is that separate? That's a separate initiative. Separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Right, right. And I did forget to mention that the Gelfand um, Family Charitable Trust also has funded the, um, the middle school science fair, I'm going to say the last three years now. So this actually the school year that just ended was the, the third of three years funding the middle school science fair initiative. That's the Gelfand Family Char Charitable Trust. That's their f primary focus is to support an inquiry-based learning in, in science in, across the state. Um, I, I just think it's great that we have, you know, that we are seeking these types of partnerships with these different organizations because they're bringing in obviously dollars um, that support programs and facility upgrades that we, you know, don't have line items for in our budget. So it's just great to expand that type of um, um, money hunt, so to speak, treasure hunt, basically. Yeah, you're correct, Mr. Mitchell. Look at what is happening across the district, uh, especially at our elementary level, to start to excite kids about the opportunity to, in a science fair as we begin to bring materials into the classroom for our teachers to teach. Uh, this is great to partner. I had an opportunity to meet uh, Kim, uh, representing the mm -hmm. Gelfand uh, Foundation, about a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you heard me talk about it yesterday at the opening, how exciting it was to go into Brockton High School uh, a 40-year-old plus building and to walk in and see a state-of-the-art lab. Uh, our students, I'm not sure Miss um, Walder can talk to you today if they actually went in and used the lab today, but it was just exciting to see that our children would have those opportunities. So thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Um, motion to approve the Gelfand Family Charitable Trust GEMS four-year STEM implementation grant. Motion is made, probably second. All in favor? Oh, so moved. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, on Title One and Title II. Um, <clears throat> I was going to direct my question to Mr. Jerome, but I don't think he's here. So maybe the superintendent or, or Ms. Walken Watts could help me. Um, in terms of uh, the state and federal grant money, the Title One, Two, Three, et cetera, here, millions of dollars worth of grants, um, superintendent, which ones, which of these items? would be impacted by our percentage of free and reduced lunch? Um, would be impacted, Mr. Carpenter? In other Carpenter? words, right. It, it, my understanding from past years is that the amount of money that we can qualify for is affected by our percentage of free and reduced lunch, that it's a determining factor. 
You know, I believe I believe they all are. Um, yeah. I can't speak to that. I'm not sure, okay. Mr. Petronio. Yes, you know. Each one of the Title One, Title Two, Title Three. I know they're obviously for very right. specific purposes, but I think overall there's a formula. Okay, so. In other words, so the higher our percentage of free and reduced lunch, potentially more money we can reap from these grants. Exactly. Title I, Title II, Title III, our E-rate funding, um, many of these streams of, of revenues that we receive are based on our uh, poverty and our free and reduced lunch. Right, so that being the case, I just wanted to, over the last couple of years, we've talked at this time of the year about it, in, increasing our efforts to get all the lunch forms in, the importance in, in what difference a couple of percentage points can make in our free and reduced lunch in terms of potentially millions of dollars of grant money coming in. And I know specifically after October 1st of last year, we had some conversation about perhaps being able to improve our efficiency in getting free lunch inputted before October 1st. I just wanted, maybe Aldo could just give us an update as we, to... We, we just had this conversation today. Oh, okay, Mr. yeah. Petronio, so if like we could get just a, we're an update in terms of... We're actually very the efforts yeah, and we're looking things to... Things we may have be doing differently to improve because our Because you're numbers. correct, Mr. Carpenter. It, it does uh, increase the money that we get into the district uh, in, in certainly a number of ways. Just from our conversations from last year and actually prior years, we've continually looked at how we can get the applications in, not only in over the course of the year, but in by October 1st, because October 1st is the deadline that, that everything is kind of uh, based on or judged on for all the different cities in Massachusetts, cities and towns. So what we've done this year is we have an effort going where I've moved the lunch application process from Brockton High School cafeteria, the, um, the lunch preparation area. I moved it into the computer lab in the first or the basement floor of Central because we have a bank of computers down there and I had the software installed on 15 or 20 of the computers and we're going to be using our regular day staff but we're going to be bringing in uh, night staff to process applications every single night starting with the first day of school starting with today. Um, the staff every night will be inputting every application hopefully within 48 hours of receiving them and what we're going to do differently this year than prior years is, is if an application is rejected, that's going to go into a triage pile. Because although an application is rejected as being free or reduced, there's still an opportunity for that um, child or that student to be considered free or reduced by linking them to a family that is free or reduced. So if you have a niece or a nephew living with, an, uh, living with their aunt or uncle, and that aunt or uncle is free, that the, the federal law says that that niece or nephew is free. So. By doing that linking, we can increase our, our actual count. We can show a more real picture of our student body. So that's one of the efforts that we've changed that's different from last year to this year. Uh, we're doing a raffle to get applications in, um, again, as quickly as possible, as fast as possible. And we have more of an outreach um, that we've had in prior years. We, we have um, the one person that we hired uh, a little over a year ago, Anna DeAndre. She's been doing community outreach. All all through the summer and currently now she's going to all the open houses she's been to the picnics all the different you know the Haitian picnic the Cape Verdean picnic she's been out in the community explaining the lunch application process and making everyone feel comfortable with with filling those forms out so by educating them and and making them feel comfortable about getting them in and explaining the importance about them being in as as quickly and early as possible there are some people that feel well we don't want the lunch but She's making them understand, but it also brings us in Title I money, E-rate money, by having those filled out. So she's been doing that outreach to bring that, um, those that were missing in. And this year, um, with the new employee that we have, Bull Lim, who is our data, um, I guess database engineer is what I would call him, He's been able to do a process, um, what we call direct certification with the state. If a child is free or reduced with the state, we upload our files to the state and they come back and tell us of our 17,000 students how many they're directly certifying as free. Now, when you can imagine when you upload two databases together, a misspelled name or a hyphen in between the last name will create a mismatch. He went through and he's actually um, able to remove all of the 
commas, dashes, periods that are in these names in our database and make them more generic so that they actually match up better with the state list that's provided. So already at this point from last year to this year, I think we have a thousand more students already matched because the first um, effort was made and I think it was 5,700 students were matched. 800 kicked out as near matches, what the state calls. He was able to go through that list and match up most of those near matches. So we're almost at 7,000 that have been what we consider directly certified, meaning we don't need an application on them. They're all set, and that designation stays for the entire year. So we don't have to go back out. So these different efforts that we've made, I think will get us, hopefully, um, a few percentage points higher in our free and reduced lunch count. And if so, in turn, that's gonna translate next year into more dollars for the district. And less, you know, um, less children either going hungry or feeling that they can't get a lunch because they don't have any money with them. They'll, they'll know that they can go and, and have a lunch. for, you know, when Aldo and I spoke today, you know, to, for having the foresight to look at what we consider a problem, having difficulty getting all of the forms back, and we know that these children would qualify many of them. So to be able to put not only a person on top of this, but to be able to do outreach in the community, how great is that, that the parents have confidence, they understand the process, and, and we certainly are, are seeing improvements. And we will continue to do that for everything. Every dollar is important to us for every child in this district. And we just are now putting together a packet that'll go out to the principal shortly that we've spoken with the Department of Ed and with the state auditors who handle school lunch. And there is a, a mechanism where if a principal, guidance counselor, nurse feel that a student who hasn't brought an application in is needy of a free lunch, then there's some guidelines they follow and they can fill out the application for that student. So again, if there's uh, no communication or broken communication with the parents, the principal at this point has a tool they can use to um, you know, take care of that child. Mr. Yeah, no, that's great, I appreciate that. This has been a focus, I think, for the last couple of years in terms of our improving our efficiency in getting all the lunch forms in, and, and particularly, you know, for the families again this year, it's just really critical that we get those lunch forms in ASAP, because it can mean a tremendous amount of money coming into the Brockton Public Schools by getting all the lunch forms in. So thank you, Aldo. Thank you. I've recently um, been doing some reading on the Boston Public Schools. I've recently signed up with the Federal Universal Free Lunch, lunch Program. Yes. And um, I think that's something that I'd like to explore for, as a possibility for Brockton. Do you, what do you know about it, Aldo? I met with them over the summer. Mm -hmm. Myself, Erin Long, Tom Burke, um, I think Chris Correa was in on the meeting. We met with them this summer. They wanted Brockton to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, but when we looked at they base the, the free lunch off of your direct certification percentages. So our direct certification percentage was around 41%. In order for the- What does that mean, Aldo, direct certification? Means, it means that of our student body, those are the students that are identified as SNAP recipients mm -hmm. or you know, um, food stamp recipients. So those are the ones the state has told us we have, not we told them. They told us of your student base, this is who you are. So. We can do the universal free lunch, and there's a certain factor they give you towards every meal that you give back. Well, at 41% of their um, direct certified rate, we would lose over a million dollars with the program, the way it currently is, because of what it costs us per meal. But if we can get that direct certification figure up to about 60%, then the program at that point, in my opinion, will break even. So we can give free lunch to everybody and get fully reimbursed. Okay, so, so our food service program would, right now would lose about a million dollars. About, about a million and a half. I just, I did it at, at okay, the table. Okay, but we'd have the opportunity to provide lunch to every single student. Yes. Okay. Uh, how would it impact our Title I funding? We're, we're not supplying the, um, the applications any longer. I'm glad you asked that. That's, that's the biggest piece to swallow. Um, when I brought that point up that all of our additional fundings are based off our free and reduced lunch mm -hmm. counts, they said, oh, well, we'll provide you with a financial form that you can send home to every parent that they can fill out their income on. Isn't that the same thing that we're doing with it's the It's the same thing lunch as a lunch applications? application, mm -hmm. but in my opinion, it's harder to get back, I think. 
than a lunch one. Yeah, be. because there's no incentive. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I just heard on the radio as you did Boston went into it two days ago. I don't know if that's something. Yeah, I read it in the Globe. Yeah, there was a piece in the Globe. Over I don't know if it's something it. that they were pushed into doing mm -hmm. or if, it, if their figures are so high it's, it's worth it to them. But uh, I'd like I also to know don't. what funding they're losing as a result of it. <laughs> right, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But um, and, and my thought was in getting parents to fill out financial forms and send back, I'm going to get a lot of them back NA or blank. If we could find a way to be able to offer that free, that free universal lunch, just like we do with the breakfast, mm -hmm. and not jeopardize our Title I funding, because they're, they're servicing the same students. Exactly. Then exactly. I think it would be worth us looking into. Well, the state was calling this a pilot program, mm -hmm. so I think depending on how they see it goes in Boston, Let's maybe they'll, they'll change it. School year. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like I'd like said, to keep a handle on it. I mean, and keep an eye on it. The state has used us for the pilot breakfast programs, and mm -hmm. they've worked out well for yeah, us. Yeah, they have. So actually, two different programs. One works yeah. better than the other. Mm -hmm. So, um, but. Um, we, we've been involved with them, so hopefully if this lunch program works out well, then they can make it fit us, our needs, and then that would be wonderful. If we so right now you would recommend that we go the status quo, that what we've been doing, trying to, re, trying to increase our numbers by the form, yes. and see how this new federal program plays out with the larger districts, larger than us, which there aren't too many, but how it works out in Boston. Right, and exactly. And are there any other communities that are doing it in Massachusetts right now? I don't think, um, I don't think so. I know so. they were targeting some. Like they, Plymouth and Springfield and some other communities like that. I have a monthly meeting with the urban superintendents in the mm -hmm. state. So that's certainly something I can bring up for an agenda item just to follow and see if there are other communities or how that's working out. Yeah, it, it'd be nice to see how it plays out this year. If, if they could use our direct certification rate to apply it to Title I, Title II, then that would be wonderful. Yeah. Then there'd be no mm -hmm. forms involved. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's with their, their pilot programs, maybe that's what they'll find out. Yep. But our program, you know, we're just now um, getting extra income from it that we've been putting back into equipment, really the past two or three years. So at this point, I don't think we can go back and say, okay, we're going to run it at a loss <coughs> because any losses in that program would have to come out of non-net money, mm -hmm. so which we don't have. That's our mm -hmm. busing money. So. Okay, so we'll see how it plays out this year, and then maybe. Oh yes, they're, they're take another look. We're see. in constant yeah. um, discussions with them. Okay, well that's great. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Commander, would you enter? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to be made, probably seconded, to approve the reports on Title One and Title Two. Oh, so moved. Thank you all. Next up is the report of the Superintendent of Schools. Well, I'm excited to tell you that. Uh, this morning I was able to visit uh, Brockton High School, my first stop. Uh, I went on to East Middle School. I went on to the Baker School, uh, and I finished up at the Keith Center. Um, you know, some of the comments I made, you know, <coughs> walking in, there was a real sense of community. You know, teachers were greeting parents and students. There were a number of schools that were dressed in their school colors. They were, you know, excited to have the students and parents on board. Uh, when I came into Brockton High, you would not believe that 3,800 students had walked through the door this morning. You know, truly people were in classes. Um, you know, they were engaged in learning. Uh, Main office was very calm. I building was in, you know, beautiful, uh, bright. It, it was it was a great place to be this morning. Uh, went over to East Middle School, and what they had done, they had all the students in the auditorium. Uh, dispersing them to their home rooms with their homeroom teachers. Uh, my favorite, of course, were the children at the Baker. I told them I would be reporting to you. Uh, nobody knows who the superintendent of school is, by the way, when you're a first or second grader. It is interesting, some of the comments. But I said, well, what would you like me to, I'm gonna tell the school committee that I came to visit, and, and what would you like to share? And they wanted to share with you that they're really excited to learn math, uh, they want to be smart, and they were wondering about lunch. So <laughs> it's apropos that we talk about it. Um, I know, wouldn't that have been great to, to promise them? It, w it was interesting, I will have to tell you, uh, even walking at the Baker with, you know, again, youngsters, uh, first grade through fifth grade. And Mr. Powers uh, and Mr. Donovan, his new assistant principal, uh, had time to walk through the building, to, 
you know, we, we walked through the whole building, and again, it, w it was just running very smoothly. Parents were gone. I, I didn't. I came in about a half hour after they started. There were no criers. I don't quite remember it that way when I was the school adjustment counselor. So I was quite impressed. Um, I will tell you uh, again, and and we'll be sharing uh, what's happening. But our enrollment uh, was up as of today. Now understand, we don't have kindergarten there. We continue to register. Two figures I want you to hear. Uh, we had 15,130. We're already up 816 from last year at this time. We served from Monday to Wednesday in the Parent Information Center, registered 200 additional students in those couple of days. So at this point, I'd like to invite uh, elementary. Uh, Liz Barry, would you like to come up in and share with us? Actually, in, in Mr. Jerome's absence, I'm going to try to do justice to the middle school level first, okay? Um, at the middle school level, this month, East Middle School's new science lab will debut with hands-on scientific exploration for students. Science teachers, science teachers are working together to design the layout of their new lab, and administrators are utilizing direct funding and a $2,000 grant that they received from Big Lots. Um, the school won an online voting competition that actually involve the students this spring. We believe that this new lab will expand the school's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, their STEAM initiatives, and give students an opportunity to explore scientific concepts. The program entitled Empower Yourself, which is a highly regarded after school financial literacy program, has been expanded this year from two middle schools to all middle schools in the city. Last year, the Ashfield Middle School and Plouffe Academy students became experts in finance and economics and triumphed over students from Cambridge in a financial literacy course at the Federal Reserve Bank. This year, the free program will be expanded to include at least 100 more students from grades 6 to 8, and the Ashfield and Plouffe students will participate in the highly competitive International Economic Summit, which challenges students to solve problems within a simulation of a global economy. Now moving down to the elementary level, um, schools were clean, hallways were orderly, classrooms were busy with activities that were engaging to students throughout the day. Um, teachers were calling their new students by name and enlisting their assistance in establishing classroom rules, routines, expectations, a real great way to set the tone for another successful school year. I even saw examples of student work posted on the wall already, first day of school. As early as 9 o'clock, hallways were clear as students were already within their classrooms, um, busy with activities that would allow them to get to know their classmates as well as their teachers. I mean, this kind of movement is so um, impressive to me every year. And we're talking about encouraging hundreds of kids and, and directing them to where they need to be. Sometimes they're reluctant to do so. They're nervous about their environment. And it's just something that we do really, really well here in the city. I think it speaks to the organization, professionalism, and the collegiality um, among our staff in our schools. As Mrs. Smith said, there are some new leadership teams worth highlighting at the elementary level. Nicole Ford has been promoted to the interim assistant principal at the Hancock School. She is replacing Natalie Pohl, who will serve as the interim principal of the Barrett Russell School this year. Former Angelo School teacher George Donovan joins the Baker School as its new assistant principal. And we believe that these dedicated educators will bring expertise, creativity, and commitment to each of these buildings. And visiting them today, you could just see they were like seasoned, uh, that they had been doing this for quite some time. The Positive Behavior Intervention and Support PBIS program has been adopted across the system this year, K-5, to with full implementation happening at the Davis, Hancock, and even the Barrett Russell Kindergarten Center. The lessons of PBIS were on full display today as students began the year with positive reinforcement for good behaviors like listening, following instructions, walking in the hallway, and being polite and courteous. The students at the Arnone School were already earning their tiger paws today for their model behavior. And the new outdoor classroom space that they established over there over the summer is already serving as a nice incentive for students there.
at the Kennedy School, second grade students were writing paragraphs about themselves, and this was within the first hour and a half of the day. Um, grade one students at the Angelo School were actually skip counting as they were lining up outside with their brand new teachers. The relationship between Bridgewater State University and the Huntington School was evident even today on the first day of school. Three student teachers were actually starting today alongside their cooperating practitioners. Um, at the Davis School, just thinking about um, some really nice visuals, um, over 1,000 students, grades one to eight, were greeted by faculty in their red Davis Strong t-shirts today. Now on to the little ones. Um, Pre-K and kindergarten classes, they actually begin on Wednesday, September 18th. It was really great to see all of the kindergarten teachers um, supporting the rest of the teachers and getting all of the kids to their classrooms today um, and helping some of those reluctant grade one students to find their teachers for the year. Um, full day kindergarten classes, um, they're located at every elementary school and also the new Barrett Russell School, which is on Oakdale Avenue and pre-K is centralized at the Gilmore Early Childhood Center. Information packets regarding kindergarten and pre-kindergarten have been mailed to parents of all registered students, and kindergarten screening is scheduled for September 12th, 13th, and 16th. Orientation sessions for parents will be held on Tuesday, September 8th, 17th, and 18th. And this is my third opening, and by far the best one yet. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you, Liz. And can we invite our high school team up, new principal Sharon Wolder and uh, our new associate principal, Bob Perkins. Good evening. Uh, Bob is sitting over there. Bob Perkins, you have yet to meet him, so I wanted to make sure that I pointed him out to you and introduced you. Uh, as most of you know, Bob has been working in Brockton Public School System for 35 years, um, and he was excited about the opportunity to be the associate principal and, and to continue his committed work to the system. So I wanted to make sure you met Bob tonight. I also want to say it was a great opening. It, it, was, it, it was fabulous. We had a great opening today. Uh, we had 3,818 students, which is 91% of our student body in attendance on time. About 1,200 of our students are freshmen. So we knew we needed to extend our homeroom period to give them time to find their way, to get acclimated to the school. Our freshmen homeroom teachers were phenomenal with them. They were drawing diagrams on the board to help them figure out how to get from one place to the other. Uh, when we had our announcements, our, we have three seniors who came down. They do morning announcements. I said, share some words of wisdom with the freshmen. So one of them said, I just want to make sure you all know there is no fourth floor. Because that's one of those things, the myth of Brockton High, that there's a fourth floor and freshmen should go there. Uh, and then we had one who explained to them, and tomorrow and Friday you do not have school. They didn't believe her. Uh, they kept thinking, we have to come to school tomorrow, and so we had to try to convince them on the way out the door, so I'm glad you're making the call uh, to let everyone know there is no school tomorrow. But uh, we got off to a great start, and it, the energy was positive, the students were very positive. It was a great day. Uh, we had a few glitches. We are working on a new intercom system, and with the new system, there were a few flaws, so we went back to the 40-year-old system that was flawless, and so uh, as we go through things and it's uh, the single wire system that is also going to be uh, our system in case of emergencies that we can get messages to people so we're going to work it out uh, but today when we started I was getting calls to the main office I can't hear you over here I can hear you in the hall but not in the classroom some of it was human error because people forgot to turn the speakers up in their rooms and some of it the message just wasn't getting out so we went back to our old system uh, to make sure that everybody was hearing our messages and we modified our day 
days so that uh, students had a little more time to get to class because we had the extended homeroom and we had students leave a little early to get to the buses. Had a, it's always difficult to get everybody to find where their bus goes because it drops off in one place, it drop, picks them up in a different place at the end of the day and the numbering system is different. So we wanted to make sure that we were out there and getting our students home on the buses. Uh, and one other little glitch we had, we did have a skunk join us this morning. Um, he was unexpected. Um, in our project grads um, area outside where they keep all of the toys, uh, one of the paraprofessionals went out to set up the play area for the children and she went running back into the building because a skunk moved into the toy section. And so we had the school police and the animal control and the custodial staff all out there moving the skunk along as he sprayed and ran off. Uh, but no one was injured and there were no issues. It was just one of those things that as um, Superintendent Smith was saying, oh, it was so quiet and, and we were outside trying to get rid of a skunk. So. Uh, it was, it was truly a great day. We had a great opening. We are excited about uh, the energy of Brockton High School and our biotech lab did open today with classes. Uh, we have a few more pieces of equipment that are going into the lab, but the kids were so excited about being in there. The teachers were really excited about the possibilities of what can happen in that room. And we, at some point, would like to have all of you come because the students will want to do some lab demonstrations for you to see. So uh, down the line, there will be invitations for all of you to join us in our biotech lab. Questions for Ms. Walden? Mr. Donegan. We don't have to wear hazmat suits if we go there, right? No, you don't. Okay. Um, with respect to the attendance, 91% um, uh, of, well, how does that compare to other years? We usually start out the first day or two. Um, our attendance tends to be low as we move forward. Part of it is we have kids who have actually been enrolled in other school systems, uh, and they took them in without having them withdraw from Brockton High, so some of that will be cleared up. I, I think part of it is because they knew they had one day and then two days off, our attendance will be higher on Monday. Mm -hmm. I'm anticipating that. Uh, but it's pretty comparable to years past. We're usually 91, 92%. And um, speaking as a parent of a, of a newly arriving freshman there, uh, he came home with the typical nonchalance of a 14-year-old, so I, I imagine it must have been a good day for him. So. Thank you, Mr. Donegan. Any other questions for Ms. Walder? Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Ms. Walder. I know you mentioned uh, you let the kids out a little bit early. Yes. To get to their buses? Yes. Did that all work out? Everybody got home safe? And Everyone got home safe. We did have a few glitches with buses getting students on. Uh, I contacted Mike right away. He contacted the bus company and they sent buses right out to get the students. So w we know that if they miss the bus to have them wait and we can work it out to get a bus to them. Uh, we had no complaints about anyone not being able to get home. We made sure everyone got out to the buses and there are also late buses so some of the students who were kind of military around and trying to figure some things out, the late buses did come on time and, and got them uh, home safely. That's what I was wondering. If, the, if there were kids at the end of school that didn't get home, they were taken home eventually? Yeah, everyone made it home. Uh, and we do have some students who, they don't leave right away because they're talking to their teachers or they're talking to their friends or they're figuring some things out about the school and the buses were gone by the time they made it outside. But we do have the late buses, so we have that safety net there for them. And we have people who help them find their way to their buses. And one other question. We, you were talking about the skunk. You mentioned he was a he. Well, it, it could have been a she. Put, I didn't get close enough it. to find that out. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you know, that's all. French accent. <laughs> <laughs> we did call him Pepe Lipu. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Healy. When you first arrived at Brockton Night, you didn't go to the fourth floor, did you? No, I did notice there was a floor and the, there was a gate and it was chained up, so I always wondered what was up there, but I knew that it couldn't have been a classroom. Smart lady. Not again? What? Did you have another question? Okay. Everybody else set? Any other questions for Ms. Walden? Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Walden.
And I did spend the end of my day, I mentioned, uh, at the Keith Center, the alternative school. Um, I will tell you visiting the Champion, uh, the Pathways, uh, the, the B.B. Russell students, again, and, and Brockton, again, should be lauded for this, that you know students have an opportunity to get that high school diploma. I was talking to a lot of the kids there. They talked to me about summer jobs they had, and already they were certainly you know, in the mindset that, that that's where they were moving towards. Dr. Tarasi, would you like to share your, your time there today? Thank you. Um, I, I did visit our various alternative school programs, and uh, I'll echo what other people have said. We had a, a very, very smooth opening. Uh, one, uh, visiting the school, you would have been struck with the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the amount of caring and the willingness of the staff to uh, accommodate the diverse needs of students. Uh, these are, in many respects, our most needy students, and um, that that, that idea of caring and uh, accommodation was was evident today. Um, our attendance was uh, was was pretty good. Probably not as good as the mainstream schools. Uh, the, the the guarded school opened today with an 87 percent attendance rate. Uh, the champion opened with an 85 uh, percent attendance rate. Um, a little, little bit of an attendance glitch at the Russell. We had a, a it was just under 60 percent, and so we're calling and we're not sure whether that was related to the the one day of school and then the two holidays or whether you know students have decided to you know sometimes drop out and then we have to re-engage them via the pathways um, and get them back into school but I can assure you that um, the, the staff at the Russell the assistant principal uh, was in the process of calling every household that had an absent student and uh, we'll you know we'll have that probably rectified by Monday and are expecting a much better turnout um, we have 56 ac active students in the pathways center and as you know, those pathway students are all on individual plans leading toward graduation. And uh, we partner with uh, Massasoit Community College. And so I'd like to also let you know that uh, we have two courses that will begin on Monday on site at the Pathway Center. And both of those courses will be conducted in partnership with Massasoit Community College and conducted by uh, Massasoit uh, professors. Um, so that's, uh, the, those, those are college credit-bearing courses. If students uh, score high enough on the AccuPlacer. Um, and at, at the uh, first school assembly at the Russell School today, one of our students who had won a poetry contest, a statewide poetry contest, by, by writing uh, and performing a, uh, a, a rap um, was publicly re publicly recognized at the Russell School. He had formerly been recognized by the Department of Education with a plaque and a gift card, and uh, he was acknowledged by the staff and, and students at, um, uh, at the Russell today and recognized for his creativity and writing skills. So that was kind of a, a nice way to start off the, uh, the year. Thank you, Dr. Tarasi. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Donnie. One question. Um, with, this is with respect to attendance. One of the things that I uh, notice sometimes, um, there are some kids who, if they're involved in, in the court system, oftentimes there's an order that said, you know, you have to attend school. And then they wind up back in court for lack of attendance at school. Is there any um, special attention given to those? Do you do you work with the probation department at all in the court? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I was there and um, have, we, today ran into Reggie Vibia, one of the POs, and uh, he was already there checking on one of his kids. And yeah. so there is kind of a close relationship between uh, the the various per, uh, probation officers and uh, and and the students. Right. They know all the staff, and they they're they're in the building quite often checking on their kids. So um, and they're all you know obviously everybody's hooked up with adjustment counselor too. So, um, not for lack of trying, okay. but difficult work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Trossi. So the next item, Common Core. I want to speak to the Common Core. Uh, we've had a, a number of inquiries, and in looking back, uh, last year you had uh, quite a lengthy presentation. I believe it was at one of your subcommittee meetings on uh, Brockton uh, and our movement into the Common Core. Uh, what we'd like to do for the community, we also had had an inquiry from the Enterprise, uh, who was doing a regional article on what school districts are doing to prepare for Common Core to prepare for a park. So we'd like 
to prepare for you, uh, for our principals, for our administrators, making sure we're sharing this with our parents, a timeline of just what has happened in the Brockton Public Schools actually over the past three years. Uh, this will give us an opportunity to share with the parents uh, the, uh, the change with the, the rigor, uh, the complex text that the children are reading, the change in some of the mathematics standards, um, looking at our writing program across the curriculum. So we hope to have this for you in a couple of weeks and again we're going to uh share it you know, throughout the community. We also want to remind everybody that if there are questions, our parents, about the Common Core, we have wonderful parent academies. And this is not something new. Uh, I was just mentioning earlier to Mrs. Joyce that you know, we've done, we did this years ago when we changed to MCAS and to MCAS testing and implementing the uh, curriculum around MCAS standards. And what we did, we shared with the parents what their children were learning in school, why they were learning it, how they could assist their children. So our parent academies, you know, certainly will be doing that. We'll be encouraging and I'll be working with the principals to making sure that at their individual schools they're also sharing some of these things with the parents. Questions for superintendent? Okay. Uh, update on the educator. And our update on our educator evaluation training, I am pleased to tell you that we have begun to implement the educator evaluation tool. We actually had three cohort groups the past two weeks, uh, and these were principals and leadership teams throughout the districts, uh, along with uh, a Brockton Education Association member, teachers, that will now go back to the buildings throughout the district to train all teachers, all staff, you know, in uh, implementing our tool. Uh, so again, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Kathleen Moran, our Executive Director of Human Resources, to come up and share with you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. As, Super right. As Superintendent Smith mentioned, in August we had teams from every school in the district who attended three full days of training. We also included the department heads and coordinators who also um, who also assess and um, evaluate teachers. These teams work to review all aspects of the new tool and will now train all educators in their respective buildings. The teams included both administrators and teachers who, des who designed plans to implement the training at the school level. Yesterday, Superintendent Smith spoke about the new system to the um, staff at the high school in the morning and reminded everyone that we'll work through this process together and use this new tool in a, in a systematic approach. Principals were also asked to introduce their training teams to their staffs at their first staff meeting yesterday. And we will continue to monitor the progress um, as we implement this, in this across the district. Questions for Dr. Moran? Thank you. <coughs> Next is the... Next we have the Barrett Russell School update. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, the Barrett Russell, Russell School is um, almost ready to go. It um, actually looked great last week and then all the furniture was delivered and was getting set up so now it looks cluttered again so uh, if you go in there it's loaded with cardboard boxes and we moved in all the teacher materials from teachers that were moving from schools from other schools into the into the Russell so when you go in there there's stuff in the hallway so it's cluttered but um, it will be ready for um, next Tuesday night which is the open house September 10th um, and again, it'll be little odds and ends to finish up, um, you know, a few, um, some painting, uh, but the, the parking lot's been paved from, I think the last time I was here and spoke, the parking lot had not been done yet. Uh, the fencing work is all complete uh, around the building. Um, so all the outside work has been done. Uh, they're finishing up the new LED lights that are, are going to brighten up the parking lot at night. Um, so we're also, just so you know, there's a, um, in the back of the Russell, we're going up by the basketball courts to the left of the basketball courts. There used to be an exit that went out onto Milton Street and then over to Market. Um, we're gonna reopen that and only use it for the five buses that will be serving that school. Um, it's 
I, we checked with the traffic commission. We checked with the um, with the DPW, the mayor's office. That is our property. Um, it was it, when it was an alternative school. It was decided that that entrance would be closed for cars. It will not be used for cars. It would just be used so the buses can can exit. Uh, Lieutenant Mills uh, and Mr. Thompson were there last week, and they brought a bus over to do a pilot to see if the bus could turn around in the parking lot, and it just it, it couldn't do it. So um, for the safety of the kids, it was much easier for the bus to come in, drop them off, and then proceed straight ahead and go out that exit. So, uh, and I wanted you to know, I think it's Mr. Sullivan's ward, just in just in case there's any calls from. It will be only buses exiting that that area. What two? Is it what two? It's not you. All right. All right. Geez, I'm way off. <laughs> Five wards off. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so just I wanted to let you know, so if you get any calls that, again, it, we have the right to open that and it will only be for the, the buses. I think there's, there's five buses and I think there'll be about five vans. So, uh, and it will only be open in the morning when they exit and then um, again in the afternoon for them to exit. So other than that, it's in, um, it's in great shape. Um, they're putting the air conditioners in the windows now and um, the computer system's being set up. And um, again, we should be ready to roll when it opens on the on the 18th and the staff has been in there working hard setting up and um, so we should be in good shape so I can take any questions on the Russell if anybody has any questions for Thomas, Mrs. Joyce uh, we, a few of us uh, Andy was with me um, we took a tour of the school last week was it Andy or the week before last Friday uh, and oh that's right Linda um, Mary Belzati was with us as well and it was a wonderful tour I was so impressed with just how much had been done I had been in the school a few years before before we closed it and I always loved the building anyway it has great architecture and uh, what really struck me was the wonderful color schemes that was selected and and just you know, they straightened the floors that were a little crooked yeah. and the big hallways and bright sunny rooms, colorful rooms. It's just a very welcoming environment, especially for our younger kids. Yeah. So it's really a great place to be and I think our kids are going to be very happy there. I know, I know our staff will be happy there. Um, and I was really amazed at just how much green space is in that, in that school and I'd never really been out back because it was overgrown at the time, but, uh, sorry Bill, but um, it's the Italian to me I guess. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> but we, um, it, I'm really excited about what we can do with that area for the kids to be able to play and have some, you know, playground area in addition to what's out front. Uh, I did have a question on that, opening that road, because when we went there, that wasn't a plan at the time. No. Is there going to be a gate for, when, for off hours so we don't have traffic through there? Exactly. Um, yeah, there will be, it will be gated. That's okay. going to be done. Actually, it should be done this weekend yeah. um, where the gate will swing open and then lock back by so the custodian assigned to do um, you know the duty in that parking lot yeah. uh, will unlock it in the morning and then lock it in, in yeah, the because I can see that being problematic yeah there'll don't, be no we don't get yeah it. it will definitely be locked during okay and the paving was a great job yeah. and you know I really have to hand it to to our you know uh, facilities department and what they've been able to do in a short period of time because yeah. we kind of waffled on what we were going to do so we didn't give them a lot of time to be able to, to work and uh, they really came through for us and I'd like to thank them publicly for thank everything you. they did for us in yeah, the Yeah, they've department. done a great job. Um, they've really done a great job. So I just really, you know, come to the open house, parents come to the open house, check it out. I think you'll be completely impressed with just what a great facility yeah. it is. I don't think we'll let it go again. No, yeah, no, it's thank really you. Great. Yeah. It would be nice exactly. to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Joyce. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, one quick question. Sure. You mentioned an open house. Yes. What was the date on that, Mike? September 10th, and it's Tuesday night. Yep. So is that a Tuesday? It was in our packet this week, so. 5.30 to 7.30. 5.30 to 7.30, September. Thank you. September 10th, Tuesday night, 5.30 to 7.30. It's sometimes for all the open houses, I believe, are in our packet this week. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Thomas on the um, Barrett Russell? Mr. Minicello. I pulled down there just the other day to check out the, the driveway and it looks fantastic. Um, I think I was there though around um, maybe 5, 5.30. That park is used quite a bit yes. by all sorts of groups. There's lots of people, lots of adults. Um, 
do? Definitely when, you know, those students, I mean, they'll be exiting around 3 o'clock, right? The yes. dismissal time. So there's going to have to definitely be supervision when those kids are leaving because, you know, we there's plenty of people using those parks for soccer and football and all the other programs. So um, there'll be a lot of activity. So just yep. FYI, yep. beware, you know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know um, we had a plan for the school police to be there often, especially at dismissal time. I've also talked to the parks department head because that's their field and asked if they could kindly not um, rent it out until after four o'clock on weekdays. And, you know, he said he'd look at his schedule and, and, and try to make that accommodation. So, but you're right, we need to. I, I forgot to notice uh, how many trash barrels there are, but we should. Not definitely. enough. We yeah, need we need to, we trash because more. it just seems like, yep. you know, empty water bottles, things like that. I mean, let's yep. just make it easier for people to do the right thing rather than just leave the stuff. Exactly. Because um, it really is, like Mrs. Joyce said, a nice, a nice site. Um, and um, Mrs. Joyce said something about the paint schemes, and we have Mrs. Barry to thank for that. She, she has quite the touch when it comes to decorating these days, so yes. Thank you, Mrs. Barry. <laughs> We'll make sure when the school opens that you know we're, we're taking a look at what is happening you know what the activity is there we'll report back to you uh, it's certainly something we're aware of and you know we, we want to make sure we're a good neighbor you know with our parks and at the same time make sure our children are safe and and we feel strongly that we can certainly have the two be together so we'll report back to you on that as uh, as the children arrive any other questions for Mr. Thomas on uh, Barrett Russell? He, I think he's going to be staying for a moment to talk about transportation. Well, I have to tell you before Mr. Thomas talks about transportation, so this morning I'm leaving my home, you know, as I do to, I was headed to the high school for the first day of school, and lo and behold, large groups of my neighbors with their middle school children are, are all standing, they're all excited. And usually I would just wave and go by. Well, you can imagine now, uh, they kind of flagged me down. The bus was a little late. Um, <laughs> I made sure I spoke to everybody, told them I would personally take care of it. And I think they called and let, to let me know the bus came within a few minutes. But uh, it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it as usual, the first day, uh, the buses do run uh, a little behind. A couple schools were, were worse than others. A couple were 20 minutes to a half hour late. Um, on purpose, I asked the, the the bus company to make sure on the fir, you know the fir, almost the first full week of school that they stay at the stops longer than they normally would once the kids are into the routine. Um, you know, a few years back, the bus would pull up in about 45 seconds; it would be gone, and, and kids would be left behind. So, we, we want them to stay at the stops the first five days of school to make sure people uh, understand what time the bus comes in the morning, what time it drops off in the afternoon, so people can get get used to it and set their schedules um, and make sure that the bus is there and they're there. So uh, so that's the reason it runs a little bit late. Then uh, obviously um, the first day it takes longer for the schools to offload the kids because it's the first day. Where are they going? What lines are they getting into? What doors are they entering? So again, um, the glitches with the buses were, um, they some of them did run late, some up to 20 minutes, a half hour. Um, the all clear was given to me at 4.30 this afternoon, meaning that every bus, every van is back in the yard and cleared by the bus driver. So that was at 4.30. Um, and then there were a couple kids that were parent pickups that were le you know, left at schools. And, but those are all cleared out by Miss Barry. She Six o'clock. So, six o'clock when everybody was picked up from the school. Some, you know, some parents get tied up in traffic coming from Boston to pick up kids. So, about six o'clock, that's when you know the final kids were picked up at the schools. Those are kids who do not take buses, obviously. Um, so we have about. Well, this year we'll transport about 8,200 students. We're using 49 buses, 51 vans. That's one more van from last year and five more buses uh, that uh, the mayor and the city council were uh, gracious to give us this year. And obviously five of those buses are used, are going to be used for the B.B. Russell, um, but the Barrett Russell, and um, but also we use those five in, in, in all, you know, the other two tiers as well. The, the Russell will be a three-tier school um, run on the same 
same schedule as the elementary schools, but again, we're allowed to use those five buses in you know, the high school run and then at, obviously at the middle school run. We also obviously run uh, 36 um, vans and wheelchair vehicles around to help us with um, uh, McKinney Vento transportation for homeless students and also um, obviously students that are, are in wheelchairs. So, um, you know, again, other than running a little bit late, a um, few new bus drivers from last year because we've had, you know, we have more buses and vans that are getting used to their routes, so that also causes a little bit of problems with, um, you know, with running a little behind. But overall, it, it ran pretty well for the first day. Mr. Thomas on transportation. Mr. Carpenter. If I could just bounce back to facilities for one second, Mike, if you could also just briefly comment for everyone, one of the uh, other appropriations that we made during the summer was the refurbishing of the east and south gymnasiums, the bleachers and the floors, and um, could you give, just give us a quick update where we're at on those? Sure. Um you know, for a while, the, the facility subcommittee has been, you know, stressing the importance of getting the junior high gymnasiums back up to par. Um, and then, thanks to this committee, I know that you um, you had a meeting in the uh, um, earlier this summer to to basically hear, you know hear the bids and then and vote for the to put the bids through. For the, we did South Middle School this year, and we did um, East Junior High. Um, the bleachers and were in disrepair. Um, actually, they became we had to keep them closed and chained because they were dangerous to pull out. So obviously that was a problem to have middle school games and, and the floors had not been done in about 25 years. So what they've done and actually they're doing it now um, with obviously September being a nice month and the phys ed class is going outside, we were able to do most of this work during September. Uh, the companies have come in, they have stripped the gym floors at both south and east, uh, meaning taking it down right to the, you know, the bare wood uh, and they'll refit finish, repaint, put new logos in the center, and then the, the new high-tech bleaches will come in with, you know, they're those heavy-duty plastic bleaches um, with the remote control that come out automatically so you don't have to worry about people getting hurt, pulling them out. Again, the total of about about 120000 that, um, again, uh, that you were, um, you know, basically put towards that pro those two projects, which is uh, obviously a big help to the school. Um, and then next year, we plan next summer, um, north and west are, are on tap to, ha to have the same the same thing done. So it's been a big help, and the principals and the kids and the, and the teachers really appreciate it. So I thank the committee for their commitment to that. And again, it's been something we've talked about for a long time. Because those gyms are used by community schools, renters, um, uh, you know, a lot of the community goes and use those school, those gyms in, uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, and they're a big part of the community, so it's important that they're in good shape. Um, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Cavani. No, that's right. Just we'll, I'm looking that. forward to seeing it. As, as Mike said, there's a just with community schools alone. I mean, they're, they're, they're used by citywide residents and students. They're, besides the students at those schools, and they were really in rough shape the last couple of years. The floors, the bleachers. So it's, it was a overdue improvement, and uh, it'd be great to see those when they're finished. Mr. Johnigan. I think West was done last year, wasn't it? No. Well, it was no. refinished, wasn't it? They refin. It's the normal refinish. Okay. Um, it's 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 our custodians will strip so they're gonna the poly. It yeah, it, it wasn't sanded last year. Our custodians every year with all the the, the wood gym floors, they strip the polyurethane off and then just do a, a, another coat. So uh, that's the basic quick job that we do every year. But this is a real um, hardwood right. floor company coming in, taking it down to the the bare wood and then just doing it over and, and it, that will give you it gives you a good almost 10 years uh, um, yeah. of use and, and and the bleaches are a big thing and again um, east and south were picked first because they were in such the bleaches were in such bad shape but um, west and, and north are not far behind so that's our plan for next summer wonderful yeah I agree with mr. carpenter that you know they are somewhat of a showcase for the, for the town because the people come all over, yeah. from, from all over to play in those gyms. They're great gyms. 
Well, I was, I was at East Middle School today and having spent every Saturday there with community school basketball, you know, as Mr. Thomas said, they were stripped bare, it was bright, the custodian couldn't wait to get his hands on painting also. With the bleaches gone, he has an opportunity to get in to clean that up, to clean the vents. So we actually went through the gym today and he was very excited about telling us, you know, what he was going to get done, the pride, awesome. you know, with the principal. So again, I'm looking forward to seeing that in our gyms throughout the system. And then uh, quickly, just for some other upgrades that were done this summer, uh, yeah, you, we already talked about the Broughton High Biotech Lab, the Davis School um, early in the summer, got their new outdoor cafe, which we are planning to do and do at other schools as well. Um, the Hancock School, we upgraded the, the electrical system, which was a pretty big job, uh, to a thousand amp system to, to help um, finish the air conditioning of that building. We were able to redo the library there, put new carpet and air conditioning in their library. Um, again, when that school got the new roof, we had the problem last year with the moisture, and um, actually it was this time, la exactly this time last year. So um, the new electrical will help us, you know, put some air conditioning in there and, and just um, take away the moisture, especially when you get the hot, humid days. And then district-wide, um, we did electrical upgrades in all the schools that do not have air conditioning. So um, the Ashfield, East, West, and the plan is to we did the upgrades in the cafeterias and our plan is to AC the cafeterias so in buildings that do not have air conditioning as you know we went to school to June 28th last year and it got very hot at least now the principals will have the option of having a large area to bring kids if they have to you know rotate kids in from classes especially the second floor classes and then have kids just get a chance to get cool during the day at lunch and then again they could even run some classes in there throughout the day it's a uh, that's a kind of a pet peeve of mine I I, when you go into these schools that are not air conditioned and then you're going into you know and you're going into late June it's it's hard it's hard for the teachers it's hard for the students and um, I think if we start s small by giving them all a large area that's going to be cool it will help them out a lot and then eventually we can maybe expand that to more to more spots around the school so that was the reason for the electrical upgrades and again we're focused on the schools that do not have air conditioning Mr. Thomas, I would just like to personally thank you for a job well done. I'm surprised you got anything done, as well as being principal of the high school last year. Uh, thank you. You do a fabulous job. You're a perfect person for that job. And thank you. For the well, thanks. I, 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 but the, the, you know, Mr. Thompson and, and the facilities department has, you know, I think I give they've carried you. me a bit. So I give it to you. I thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions for Mr. Thomas? Mr. Donegan? Yeah. What's that? Our high school. Yeah, I do miss it. I yeah, I miss it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I missed uh, joking yeah. with the kids every day. Yeah, yeah. It's in good hands. With so I'll have to go up and, talk to and bother them. I'll be up I, to I bother them. I could tell them. you yeah. uh, you'd be a little bittersweet <laughs> to today. Any other questions, comments for Mr. Thomas? Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is items to refer to subcommittee. This is the point in time where either the superintendent or school committee members can offer items which they would like reviewed by subcommittee. So first I will start with the superintendent and ask if she has any items. That's no. Okay. Mr. Healy, did I see you? Motion? Yes. Uh, as uh, I was listening to the uh, projected enrollment, uh, this is actually directed at the, uh, the chair of uh, the facility subcommittee. Uh, perhaps, Bill, we should uh, get together as soon as possible and just kind of uh, uh, brainstorm about what we might have to do in the short term for next year if these numbers continue. Well, I think if I can defer to Superintendent Smith, I think that at the end of the last school year when we all agreed to this plan for the Barrett Russell for this year, I think the idea that we all kind of settled in on was this was going to be a one-year plan for the Barrett Russell with the idea that once the new superintendent uh, gets settled in and, and we got the new school year going that we would start working with the superintendent on a, on a master plan looking at the, the use of all of our facilities because okay. I think it's clear with the, with the changes in services and the increases in enrollment, there's no question we're going to need additional classroom space and um, it, it probably at this point is going to be most logical to work with the superintendent looking at the best possible use for all of our facilities going forward. So I think in, in that spirit, Mike, perhaps we could you know, work with the superintendent on a, a timetable to begin to start to take a look at that. 
Thanks, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, you've, you've certainly heard me talk far and wide about a facility master plan, and I know it's something you all addressed last year. Um, October 1st, we certainly will have firm numbers as far as what it does look like for next year, where the students are located, uh, what we're going to be doing for you know class size. So I would like to be able to do a couple of things. Uh, one is I'm starting to uh, set up appointments to look at a number of of school districts that have had facility master plans. But my goal this year is to finish uh, the entry plan, the tr transition plan coming in. But before that, as I said, on October 1st, we're going to have to plan for next year right away. Those would become short-term goals. Obviously, a 20-year plan is a long-term plan. And something we we're going to be involving the whole community. Obviously, we're going to work with our mayor, our elected officials, uh, and our community. Uh, it's something that we have to address. Um, um, you know, we, we thanked Mr. Thomas, we thanked Ken Thompson and his crew, our craftsmen, all the people that have come together to make this happen on September 18th. Uh, and I do believe that it will open now on September 18th with 300 kindergartners sitting there. But certainly, we can't be foolhardy and do that this year. You know, we need to have a plan sooner rather than later. Um, so I, again, I agree, a timeline would be a great idea uh, to sit down and come up yeah. with our plans for the year. We'll work on it, yeah. Any, any other items that anyone would like referred to subcommittee? I just have one quick Mr. one, Mr. Carpenter. Um, if we could, I would like to request that we uh, re send a review of the Edison, Edison Academy handbook to the policy subcommittee. We've got a brand new principal, Dr. Cobbs, just in place there. It's an evolving second year program, and I think he'd like an opportunity to review with us perhaps some suggested changes to that handbook, and it seems like policy subcommittee would be a great place for us to committee the whole for us to all be able to sit down with him and talk about it. I don't see any objection, so so moved. Anyone else? Questions, items for subcommittee? Seeing none, there is nothing under unfinished business, therefore I will move on to new business, items of new business. Mr. Donigan. Probably would have been more appropriate to to ask um, during the consent agenda, but I did make note that um, we we hired a number of teachers over the summer, and I wanted to welcome uh, in particular six new teachers from who, who are live in our community in Brockton. So I wanted to just publicly say welcome to the following people: um, Allison Bell. Douglas Dupoy, and I apologize if I mispronounced any names. Ashley Burgess, Brian Cass Castle, Jacqueline O'Donnell, and Shane Stand. Uh, all of those people were, were noted in that particular list. Um, they may have, I believe there are others, but they were not on that list, so I'm obviously not saying their names. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to perhaps um, ask is, we mentioned in the elementary um, summary this this evening that the Bridgewater State College uh, students are working with the Huntington School and I'd, I'd like to give uh, Mrs. Saber, the, the principal there, an opportunity to, um, if, she, if she wants to, to come in and sort of give us a, a more detailed uh, view of what what went on there, what's going on there, because I know that it was so exciting when they, when those folks from Bridgewater came in and sort of outlined their plan for the summer. So, one of the things that we had talked about was planning a, an agenda for the year for uh, all of our schools to come and share with you, you know, what is happening. Um, certainly, Mrs. Sabo will you know, be more than happy to come and share with you, especially this summer, her mm -hmm. continued collaboration with Bridgewater State University, which has been very positive for our students, uh, for our families at the Huntington School. Uh, so if you will, again, allow me, uh, I'll be sitting down. We're actually going to be working, um, sure. Mrs. Elves and I, to come up with a plan for you and a calendar so the schools can be put on notice and we'll invite them to come in and share with you what's happening across the district. You know, my goal is for, again, every one of our meetings, for you to see see what's happening with curriculum in the district, you know, authentic learning that is happening. So hopefully that is something that we'd like to be able to do. And, and I know we talked about a number of these things at our retreat, and I will be following up on uh, some of the items that you had given me the go-ahead to, uh, to move forward on. Thank you. Any other items for new business? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Sure. Motion to be made, probably second. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Thank you all.